Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Erin Maney. I am the Manager of Community Engagement and Communication for Open SUNY in partnership with Texas Tech University and the National University Technology Network, Open SUNY is pleased to welcome you to this featured fellow chat showcase webinar. Open SUNY's fellow chat webinar series aims to feature important and innovative activities, initiatives, or projects from around SUNY and from our partner organizations in supporting networking and highlighting excellence in online teaching and learning. So we're glad you joined us today. Let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat, if you would. It would be great to see the diversity of our audience. All right, well, let's go on to the next slide, if you would. A lot of uh, warmer places than where I'm at, I'm noticing, <laughs> sadly. Well, today, we are thrilled to host Dr. Christina Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell is an instructor of political science at Texas Tech University. She received her BA from the University of North Texas, her MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Dallas. Her research interests include pedagogical technique, best practices in higher education, gender and diversity, and issues in international relations. Her research has appeared in the Journal of World Trade, PS, Political Science and Politics, and the Journal of Political Science Education. She teaches undergraduate courses in research methods, game theory, public policy, international relations, and international political economy. Dr. Mitchell also coordinates the online education program for the Department of Political Science and conducts research on online educational delivery practices. She is the chair of the Texas Tech University Women in Political Science organization and serves on the university's e-learning council. Dr. Mitchell is the lead author of the recent study, Gender Bias in Student Evaluations, and has joined us as a featured speaker to share the research, literature, findings, and implications around this important study. This chat will be monitored for questions during the presentation, and we have time for a Q&A at the end. So if you'd like to type them in, I will be sure that we capture those, or you can wait until the end to um, ask and also use your mic at that time. Today's chat is also being recorded. So again, thank you for joining us, and thank you to Dr. Mitchell for your time and your expertise and being willing to share your recent findings. Great, well, thank you for having me. Um, so, I'm going to be speaking about my recent research, Gender Bias in Student Evaluation, um, you know, spoiler alert. And uh, what I wanted to start with thinking about is the gendered nature of the way students interact with, with their female professors. So for those of you who in any capacity work in higher education, um, there's definitely a difference in the way students talk to to men uh, versus the way they talk to women. So, you know, for example, um, I often get called Mrs. Mitchell. Mrs. You know, not even Ms. Um, Mrs. Mitchell, and uh, so so there's not an equivalent term for Mrs. for men, um, even if men are referred to as Mister. Um, it doesn't have the same meaning as Mrs. because Mrs. implies a married woman, um, and Mister doesn't have an equivalent. Um, so, but most often my male colleagues say that they are referred to as doctor or professor, um, rarely referred to as Mister, whereas I get Miss, Ms. and and misses. Uh, so we can see that the students engage differently um, with women in higher education than they do with men. So just to open up with a little anecdote. Um, so I, I coordinate the, uh, the online program here in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech. And we three times every semester host an open house for our online students. We have thousands of students enrolled in our online courses. And so we'll have a visiting speaker um, or someone in our department speak about a, a, you know, a salient political issue. And at the end of one of these, my co-instructor, who is a man, um, we were standing at the front of the room and students were coming up to ask questions. And they were, you know, they were lined up behind both of us. And what I noticed is there was a man talking to him and really craving his approval. Um, talking about the things he knew and the things he was excited about. And you could just feel that the student really wanted approval from the professor. And as opposed to the student who was talking to me, this was another man, um, another young man who was talking to me, and he was trying to explain to me how the electoral college works. 
Now, I know something about how the Electoral College works, having a PhD in political science, but that didn't stop an undergraduate um, young man from trying to explain to me that I was wrong about the understanding of how the Electoral College works. And so, of course, that's just an anecdote. That's not an empirical evidence of, you know, that men and women are treated differently. Um, but as I was teaching these online courses, we host, well, we have two introductory political science courses that are delivered exclusively online. And in total, those, um, those courses have about 5,000 students every semester who are enrolled in them. And so, of course, I can't do this by myself. I have graduate students, I have um, just course assistants, and then I have a male co-instructor. Co and as we were noticing, we had split up the load. So he was the instructor of record of some of these, and I was the instructor for a record for others. And so they were identical in every way other than who is the instructor of record. Um, and we noticed that the kinds of emails that I was getting and the kinds of emails that he was getting were just different. So this is an email that I received from a student. I'm gonna read it aloud. I want you personally to know I have hated every day in your class and if I wasn't forced to take this, I never would have. Anytime you mention this course to anyone who has ever taken it, they automatically know that you are a horrific teacher and that they will hate every day in your class. Be a human being, show some sympathy. Everyone hates this class and the material, so be realistic and work with people. So I wanna point out a few of the gendered terms that are in that email. Um, saying things like be a human being and show some sympathy. So a lot of the research that exists, um, it points to the fact that women are expected to behave in a more nurturing way. So students expect their, their female professors to nurture them, to take care of them, to mother them. But they don't have the same expectation of men. Um, so this is from a young male student um, who calls me a horrific teacher. That's another thing I wanted to point out because this, this young man didn't call me a horrific professor. He called me a horrific teacher, which is taking away some of the credentials and some of the authority that I have in my online classroom. Um, I got lots of other student comments the rudest teacher I've had at Tech so far. So again, talking about my personality, horrific, condescending, unapproachable. I also got a comment that I was on pregnancy leave the entire semester, so I was no help. Um, so leaving aside the fact that, you know, birthing a human being is, is a lot of work and you probably should get a little bit of leave for that. Um, I didn't take much maternity leave. Um, so, so this is a very gendered comment and the idea that the fact that I, you know, made a human and birthed this human isn't a good enough excuse not to help this student. Um, and then, of course, I got that I was a total babe, um, which is not, it's not flattering coming from undergraduate students in their evaluation comments. But as my co-instructor and I were seeing these differences, I mean, he would look at these and say, I never get this. This is not anything I ever experienced. As political scientists, of course, our initial thought was we can test this. We can look to see if there's actually a statistically significant difference um, in the way students talk to us. So as political scientists, the first thing that we wanted to do is look at what research has already been done. Um, so a lot of times when I present this research, um, especially like, uh, this research was featured in Slate, and, um, and I, you know, I didn't read the comments myself because that's a terrible idea, as I've learned from this research. Um, but as I was getting feedback from, um, from people who perhaps didn't read the study or didn't read it very carefully, a lot of times they, they were just saying, well, this is just one case. So this doesn't prove anything. But this case doesn't exist in a vacuum. This is not research that we came up with. We didn't invent this idea. Um, the existing research shows that, that there are differing criteria for the way women are um, for the way women are evaluated. So if we're thinking about why might there be gender bias, well, it's because women are more likely to be evaluated differently on their competence. Um, we tend to view women as less likely to have qualifications. I don't know if you've ever been in an experience where you walk into the classroom as a professor and you have a male TA and the students immediately gravitate toward your TA thinking that he must be the professor. So it's an assumption of competence and qualifications. Women are also more likely to be evaluated differently on our personalities. So again, that sympathy thing, women are expected to be nurturing. Um, women may also be likely to be evaluated more harshly based on their appearance. Um, so women are more likely to be viewed as sexual objects, um, especially by young men, 
And so their validity as a sexual object can be taken into consideration when students are evaluating women. Um, and of course, then there's just systemic and historical patterns of discrimination that could be at work of uh, generating this bias. But two really important studies that I would highly recommend you take a look at are the McNell study in 2015 and the Boring, yes, that is her real name, um, study of 2016, where they do very similar work to what we've done, looking at online courses that are essentially identical. Um, so the McNell um, study was able to sort of assign fake gender identities to their faculty members to see if that generated any differences, and they found that, yes, it does. Um, and then Anne Boring's study was able to look at characteristics of the student. For example, do, do men judge women more harshly than, than women do? Um, and she found consistent evidence of gender bias. So this research doesn't exist in a vacuum. We're just confirming a lot of existing research that exists. So I want to talk for a moment about our research design um, so that you can get an idea for what it is that we actually study. So the first thing we did was a content analysis. We took our official um, evaluations, the ones that are presented at the end of the semester as students write their own comments. Um, and we also looked at Rate My Professors. So this was the worst experience of my research career was reading my Rate My Professors evaluations. Um, and then we coded those for themes. So we weren't interested in whether the evaluation said she was good or he was good or, or bad or great professor. We didn't care about the positive or negative um, implications of the, the comments. All we cared about was what kinds of things do they talk about? What kinds of language do they use? Um, and then as I mentioned, my co-author co and I um, were teaching identical online courses. Um, and we just compared those official ordinal skill evaluations that we complete that the students completed at the end of the semester to see if there were any statistically significant differences. So first of all, those content analysis. So we separated out official course evaluations from Rate My Professors because obviously those are two completely different methods for students to comment on us. And the official course evaluations are going to be used in a different way. But I'm going to talk in a moment about why we did use Rate My Professors. But what you can see here is a chart that shows what percent of the comments mentioned each of these themes. Um, so we looked at personality. Did they call us rude, nice, funny, exciting? Um, we looked at uh, whether they mentioned our appearance in any way, whether positive or negative. Um, we looked at whether they thought our class was fun. Um, did they mention the entertainment value of the class, or did they mention that it wasn't entertaining? We looked at whether they um, talked about how competent we were to teach the course and whether they talked about how incompetent we were to teach the course. And finally, we looked at did they call us a professor? Or did they call us a teacher? Did they say great professor, bad professor? Um, because again, that gets into this qualifications assumption. So the, uh, the rows that are bolded are the ones that were signif statistically significantly different. So we can see that there were a lot more students who talked about my personality versus his. A lot more students cared about whether my class was fun or entertaining or boring than they did for his. And a lot more students referred to him as professor and me as teacher. So these are statistically significant differences. And one thing that was important to note is that my co-author, um, at the time he was teaching, so the time these course evaluations were coming out, he was a graduate student. Um, so he wasn't actually a professor in the traditional sense of the word. He was a graduate student teaching um, undergraduate courses. And so it's very interesting that they refer to him as professor because I had a PhD um, and I was on full time here in the department. And yet still 17% um, more students um, in their official course evaluations called him a professor versus the way they referred to me. But moving on to Rate My Professors, which again, it's, it's a terrible website and we all know it's a terrible website, but it can have implications to your professional life. So if you're looking at you know, students who uh, want to take classes and they look on Rate My Professors to see whether they would be interested in taking your class or not, um, if your Rate My Professor evaluations are really poor, then students are going to be um, steering away from your classes, which could hurt your enrollment and potentially hurt your, uh, you know, your ability to teach on campus. And while I would like to think that there's certainly no chance that when you're on the job market that someone would Google you and look at your Rate My Professors page just to see what somebody said, um, you know, I would like to think that that's impossible, but it's not. It's certainly possible that if you're on the job market looking for a teaching position, someone might Google you and see your Rate My Professors page and just, you know, glance at it. Even if they know that Rate My Professors is useless, um, it still might give them a priming effect for what kind of professor you are. Um, but the Rate My Professors evaluations, as you can imagine, um, were a lot different in terms of the way that students were commenting. So we still found that a lot more um, students in their comments talked about a female professor's personality. 
Um, but we noticed in Rate My Professors, which was different than the online evaluations, that they were very much willing to comment on my appearance. Um, and some of this is because the platform itself encourages you to talk about your professor's appearance. Um, they have chili peppers where the student can indicate if they think you're hot by clicking on a chili pepper. So this, again, encourages students um, to think about their professors as sexual objects, as sexually available to them, when that's a role that a professor should never, never be in. Um, we should never be providing a platform that encourages students to think this way. So after we did our content analysis and we found that, yes, students use different language um, and they talk about different things with male and female instructors, um, we went on to the ordinal evaluation. So we had these courses that were identical. They were, um, there was no difference in the content, the lectures, the quizzes, the assignments, um, everything in the course was identical. We did compare the grades because we thought there might be a chance that, um, that if average grades in some sections were different, um, then that might influence the, uh, the evaluation scores. But it turns out that the male instructor's grades were actually lower in the sections we compared than, um, than my sections. So if there's a grade effect, then the male instructor's um, evaluation should be worse. So there's really just minimal opportunity for any variation across sections. The only opportunity would be um, what if students emailed us as the instructor and we commented differently, um, responded to those emails differently, that would be the only opportunity for any variation. So we looked at five different categories. At the time, I think there were about 14 questions um, that the students were asked. And we broke them into categories of what kinds of things these questions were asking. So the first category was instructor specific. So was this instructor um, effective? Did the instructor provide encouragement? Um, was the instructor fair? And because there was some limited opportunity for variation in the way that I had talked to students versus the way he did, we tossed this category out altogether. We thought, you know, this might not be measuring something about gender. This might actually just be measuring whether he's a better instructor than I am, whether he's fairer, whether he's more effective, whether he provided more encouragement in his emails. So we tossed that category out and we didn't even make any comparisons or hypothesis about that. Um, the next three categories, so the instructor course category, ask questions about the course, but um, they mentioned the instructor, but there was no opportunity for this to vary. So for example, if we're thinking the instructor's ability to present information or stimulate learning, because the courses were online asynchronous and there was nothing different about his courses than mine, um, there's no reason that there should be any difference in evaluation scores across, these, across this category. Um, of course, then there were just questions about the course itself. Was it too, you know, was the workload, um, you know, reasonable? Did, was it a good learning experience? Um, questions about technology, which are very important to an online course. But again, there's no opportunity for that to vary. And the last category um, dealt with registration, advising, and accessibility. So this is something that we have absolutely no ability to control. Um, it's just, was it easy to, you know, to register for the course? We're advising procedures adequate. So we presented two, um, two hypotheses here because we wanted to look at what's the difference in the evaluation average for a man and a woman. So we said that for, the, the, again, that first, um, that first category of instructor specific, we tossed it out. We didn't even present a hypothesis here. But the next three categories, instructor course, course and technology, um, we hypothesized that the evaluation average for a man, a man teaching the course will be higher than that of a, a woman. But then we wanted to have a control category. So we thought that, you know, maybe I'm just such a terrible, terrible professor that my emails were so mean that in their ire, the students just rated me lower on everything, that they're not even reading the questions. They just assigned me ones all the way down. Um, if that were the case, if they weren't even reading and considering the question, then we would still see a difference in the administrative category where they ask about things that we have nothing to do with. Um, but since we're using this as our control, we're assuming that students actually do read the question. And if they're looking at something that has absolutely nothing to do with the course whatsoever, then we should see that the average of a man and a woman will be exactly the same in the administrative category because it's not asking anything about the course at all. Okay, so here's a bunch of fun tables. And for those of you who are statistically minded, which given that this is likely filled with many um, faculty and academics, I'm sure that this is your favorite slide. Um, so what we did is we just did a difference of means test. Um, we didn't do any multivariate analysis, but you can see that we had a lot of responses. We had a lot of students to compare. Um, so our highest N was um, 1,169 students responded to course-related questions um, for me. 
so even though um, I had a lot more students who responded, this is um, because we were able to compare five of my sections, I think, um, to only two or three of his. And you can see that our, um, our results are as expected. So for the instructor category, which again, we didn't present a hypothesis about because we know that maybe this is just reflecting that he's a better instructor than I am or nicer in his emails than I am, um, but he does have a higher, um, higher evaluation, which is statistically significant. Um, for those three categories, instructor course, course and technology, once again, he had a higher um, mean rating than I did and all three were statistically significant. And then for that control group, the group where the questions had nothing to do with the, with the course at all, completely unrelated, there was no difference. So in fact, I got 0.01 points higher, which was not a statistically significant difference. So the results were exactly as expected and exactly in line with other people who have done similar research. But so, so this is obviously, this is obviously a problem. Um, but just pointing out that it's a problem probably is enough. I think what we need to think about are what are some potential solutions to this problem? Um, so in terms of how student evaluations are used, the, the biggest problem associated with this is that many departments and universities use student evaluations of teaching um, to make hiring decisions, to make promotion and tenure decisions. And if these are biased against women, then that presents a discrimination issue. But when we're thinking about online education and technology and how, how the very platforms that we offer might contribute to this, I think that there's something definitely to be said here. Um, so so what, I, what I argue is that the, email, the comments and the email that I presented to you all at the beginning, you know, the one where I was called horrific or a total babe, I don't think a student would ever come into my office and say those things. I don't think a student would come into my office and tell me that I'm so horrific and condescending that they don't even want to say my name. Um, but what that means isn't that there's something about, you know, online education that causes people to be sexist. Um, instead, what we're observing is that there's sexism that, that's simmering underneath the surface, and we don't observe it until students are given this platform, um, until students are giving, given a Rate My Professors um, you know, a sanctioned platform that tells them, click this chili pepper if you think your professor is hot. Um, it's, it's, in, it's providing them a platform that, that lets that sexism come out. So I wanna talk a little bit about some strategies, both at the institutional level, at the personal level, and from an instructional design point of view, that we can encourage students to be more professional and reduce this bias in student evaluations. So if it were up to me, I'd probably just get rid of student evaluations altogether. But I doubt that that's something that's ever going to be realistically an option. Um, so what we have to do is work with the world we're in. And we need to create some strategies that can remind students what evaluations are for, um, that can create institutions that are more gender balanced and more favorable for women to succeed, um, and to use some, some techniques in our own online courses to keep these evaluations to be useful instead of just um, another opportunity for women to fall out of the tenure pipeline. So again, first thing we can do is we can look at ourselves. These are some really basic tips I think that we can use um, in both face-to-face -face classes and online classes. Um, so one thing that's really important I think is to make sure that women are represented in your syllabus. So we found evidence that women are more likely to be perceived um, as a teacher instead of a professor, that this qualification bias exists, um, that, that people assume that women are less qualified than men. And some of that may very well be because when they, when a student looks at their syllabus to see what readings they're going to be doing this week, that 100% of their readings for the week are written by men. Um, so this is contributing to students' perceptions that women just simply aren't qualified, that women aren't competent um, to present any information. Now, a lot of times when I, um, when I present this solution, like you need to make sure that women are represented in your readings um, every week. Every week, students need to be reading something written by a, a woman. Um, a lot of times in political science, people will say things, you know, like, what about the canon? You know, it's not my fault that the canon was written by men. Um, you know, political science was a male-dominated discipline for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, but I guarantee that if you're looking for, for example, a way to teach students about, you know, a basic theory of international relations that certainly was originated by men, um, I guarantee that there's a woman out there who's written something that will allow you to teach this. So you can teach the, what the white 
you know, men wrote, but making sure you bring diversity into your syllabus to accompany those canons um, is a great way to remind students that women and people of color equally have something to contribute to all of these conversations, which could potentially reduce that qualifications um, perception that women just aren't qualified to do these things. I think it's also important to check our language. And this is something that I typically ask men to do as well. So, so doctor and professor are our earned titles. Um, it's not unreasonable for us to ask to be called doctor or professor. And I always call students out when they refer to me as Mrs. or Miss. I tell them, no, I would prefer to be called doctor. But one thing that men can do to be allies to women who are in this position, oftentimes um, I hear men say, well, I just let my students call me by my first name. It's fine. What that does is it makes women look like we're the sort of, you know, we're the problem, that we're the ones who aren't willing to be this informal. Um, we, women often have to ask for the respect that we very much have earned. We have to ask to be called doctor. And if men are allowing their students to call them by their first name, then, um, then women who expect to be called by their professional title um, look like they're being unreasonable. So I think it's important that men also emphasize doctor or professor and to note your own language when you're introducing people. So it's certainly not unreasonable to, to imagine a situation. I mean, I've been in it myself where, you know, this is Dr. Patterson, you know, this is Dr. Tim and, and here's Christina. It's really frustrating. Um, we need to make sure that we're introducing everybody by their professional title. Um, and not just deferring to, to assuming women are less qualified or to introducing them differently. I think it's also important that we watch our language um, and make sure that we're not using too much gendered language. So if you think about it, um, we're surrounded by language that tells us that male is normal. Um, so even down to what do we call our first year students? We call them freshmen. We call them congressmen. We call them salesmen. Um, we say one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. Um, we have a bachelor's degree, not a bachelorette's degree. We have a master's degree. These are all words that are, that are assuming male is normal and that the word man must encompass both men and women. And the fact that women are, are sort of listening to this language and men are listening to this language their whole lives um, means that we start internalizing that message. Um, when we say words like her voice is really shrill, or she's hysterical, or that's so bitchy. These are gendered terms. These are terms that, that say something about specific about women. Um, so we need to watch that language in our courses. I try in my courses, in my online courses and face-to-face -face courses, to not call them freshmen. I call them first years, uh, because I think it's really, I think the way we speak really matters, and it sends a message to students about the qualifications of women. It's also really important to um, make sure women feel heard. So the White House women had a strategy where when a woman had a really good idea, someone else in the room would repeat that idea and say, I really liked Dr. Mitchell's idea. I really liked, I really liked what she said, um, just to make sure that the ideas that women have are equally presented. So this is just some basics about what we can do in our own department. Um, but there are institutional responses as well. So once again, when it comes to gender bias and student evaluations, I would be happy to get rid of evaluations entirely, um, but I don't think that I have the power to do that. Um, but there are institutional responses, I think, that can encourage um, all of us to create a better space for women to work, and that kind of space, I think, will filter down into gender bias in student evaluations. So whenever we're hiring and whenever we're asking for experts to present, I think it's been really important to make sure that women are represented. So once again, women are assumed to be less qualified. We see that students, um, you know, reflect this qualifications bias in their evaluations. So one thing we need to do is make sure that if we have a panel of experts, um, we don't want to see a mantle. We want to make sure that it's not just all men. So I don't know if y'all saw sort of a scandal recently. It was at Stanford and there was a history conference and every single speaker at the conference was a man, every single one. What that telegraphed to students at Stanford is men are the ones that are able to talk about history. And that filters down into their evaluations. They're going to call their female professors teachers, they're going to call them misses, and they're going to talk about whether they're qualified or not. So we have to telegraph that from the top. Um, we also want to make sure that we, that we prioritize diversity in hiring, that we consider um, whether we're hiring men or women, whether we're hiring people of color, or whether we're hi hiring all white individuals. 
Um, it's not necessarily saying that we should hire, you know, women just for the sake of being women, but we need to make sure that we're doing it intentionally. That if we're hiring a white man, we know we're hiring a white man and we know why, as opposed to just assuming that this is normal. I also think that we can do, so some of the strat strategies that we have here, um, at intro seminars, at orientation, um, right now we're working at, on a professional document about what is an evaluation for. So what are, you know, what are we doing in a university other than, you know, telling students how to be professional individuals? Um, an evaluation is a form of professional communication. It can be a really useful document. Um, so plenty of times when I get an evaluation that says something useful like, you should offer a review for the final, I've taken that into consideration and adjusted my coursework. Um, so evaluations can be very useful, but what we need to do is tell students what they're doing. Uh, I think if we ask students right now, why do you fill out a student evaluation of teaching? Um, most of them, you know, would focus on, well, did I have a good professor or a bad professor? Like how, how, how much did I like this class? Um, that's not what it's for. It's, pro it's for providing concrete examples of what was good about the course and what was bad about the course. Now, students aren't necessarily very well qualified to evaluate us. Um, you know, they don't have pedagogical training, and, and we do. Um, but they can provide useful information for, about their experience. But now, if I received an, a comment um, on my evaluations that says, she was really hot, also, we should have a review for the final, I'm going to discount that completely. So if we can remind students, here's the purpose of your evaluation, here's what we're going to use it for. And then I think it's also really important to prime them to let them know that they may have an implicit bias they're not, that they're not aware of. So I do this in every one of my face-to-face -face courses. I tell them before they fill out their evaluation that, um, that there are, that I do the research myself, that there are countless examples that evaluations are biased against women and against people of color. And so hopefully just introducing that into their coursework. We can put, build this into our online courses. We can send out infographics. That's what we're going to be doing here at Texas Tech. Um, just to tell them, here's what it's for. And here is how you might, um, you know, you might be biased and you might not realize it. So consider, asking students to consider, would you write the same thing if your professor were from a different country? If they were a, of a different ethnicity? or if they were a different gender, would you say the same thing? Would you evaluate in the same way? And these are some just concrete steps we can take. I think it's also important to socialize students and how to communicate with their professors. So how to send a professional email is a really important skill that will follow these students for the rest of their lives. They need to know how to send an email to a potential employer without making a fool of themselves. So in my online courses, I build in an entire unit at the beginning that just tells them how to send an email, how to communicate with me, how to read the content and be a self-starter. Um, and, and I tell them, I try to make it a little funny and engaging, but I tell them, don't, unless a professor has asked you to call them Mrs., don't call them Mrs. Refer to your professors as doctor um, or professor. And then, you know, include a subject line, include, you know, be specific about what you want. Um, because I think just enforcing those professional norms can help us get away from the kinds of comments that I presented to you all at the beginning of this presentation. Um, if, we can, if we can communicate to students that they need to have professionalism, um, then maybe I'll get fewer emails saying I'm horrific. Most recently, I got told I was a disgrace. Um, so maybe we could reduce some of that. Um, and then, of course, uh, we need to be always focused on Title IX and consent. Um, we need to be sure that women are actually actively safe in their workplaces, and we need to enforce discussion norms. Um, so in your classes, um, whether it's online in an online discussion forum or whether it's face-to-face -face in a course, um, I am extremely passionate about reminding students when they have made a comment that's inappropriate. So I give zeros in my online courses if students make comments that are um, bigoted, racist, homophobic, sexist. I just give zeros. I give no, um, you know, I, I give no quarter to students who make inappropriate comments. And I think forcing those, um, calling students out in a, in a sense of saying, no, this is an unacceptable way to speak about someone or to someone. Um, I think those factors trickle down into the evaluation, being reminded. Now, when I say you can't say that that's sexist, that very well could result in, you know, an evaluation for me. That, that's worse because they feel like I called them out and they're upset at this. That doesn't mean I shouldn't do it, but what it means is that I really need um, my colleagues that are in positions of a little bit more privilege or a little bit more power to make sure that they're also enforcing these norms. So once again, 
faculty members who are men who let their students call them by their first names, faculty members who are men who maybe don't address sexist comments, they make me look like the one who's being unreasonable. So that's where we ask for our male allies to enforce the very same norms that we, um, that we are expecting. Okay, so once again, online courses, anonymity. While I don't think student evaluations um, you know, will ever go away. One thing that I'm really passionate about is that I don't think we should ever use them in hiring, promotion, or tenure decisions. It's just simply biased. Um, we have to find another way to evaluate teaching. So whether we simply weight evaluation because we do enough research to find that 0.4 is the difference, um, we could weight them differently. We could rely on peer evaluation, which while they could be subject to the same bias, um, hopefully we can, um, we can count on our faculty members to be slightly less biased against women. And we could also encourage portfolios. So we could have self-evaluations of teaching, for, you know, tell me how many online undergraduate research projects you sponsored. I also think talking about professionalism in every online course is an important component of instructional design. And I think especially um, for, for people who are in positions of privilege to make sure that they're enforcing those norms and placing this information in their course. I have a written and enforced policy in my syllabus about sexism and bigotry, just to remind students that this is unacceptable. Um, but one of the biggest things that I've found in writing this research and the kind of comments that I get um, is that oftentimes I am, people try to explain away my experience. They try to tell me what my experience really was. And that's something that isn't helpful. I think a lot of times when women are talking about the experiences that they have, um, if they feel like the response is, but didn't you think about, but actually, but anything, um, that's going to make us feel less comfortable even sharing to begin with. So I think an important question when women are talking about this struggle with, you know, I'm being asked to present student evaluations in my tenure portfolio and they're biased against women, um, I think a great question to start with is a question of how can I help? So what can I do? I think all of us need to be asking that question. Um, whenever we hear someone's experiences as a marginalized person in higher education. Okay, so to wrap up, my research shows that male instructors receive different types of comments than female instructors. So in both the official course evaluations and on Rate My Professors, we see statistically significant differences in the themes um, in what kinds of language is used. But not only that, even in an identical online course, a man's getting a higher evaluation than a woman. Um, so the, that means that there's a discrimination issue when it comes to the use of uh, student evaluations of teaching. So I argue that it's not that, you know, online education has made this sexism happen. You know, it's not as though Facebook came out and then suddenly people made terrible comments you know, like they had these terrible things to say. Those things were already there. The sexism's already there. Um, it's just creating a platform to be able to express it. So what we need to address is the underlying sexism. Um, we need to teach students professional norms. We need to telegraph from the top down that women are equally qualified and competent to serve in panels, to serve in positions, and to be in positions of academic leadership. Um, I also um, have a current project that I'm working on. I've already collected and analyzed the data that also looks at race and evaluations. And even when we had a completely identical online courses um, and even controlling for grades, we found that the only predictors of student evaluations were race and gender. So this is really disappointing. And it means that we need more scholars um, in all fields, whether it's race, whether it's LGBTQ, to be looking at the ways that these marginalized groups are affected by, um, by things like student evaluation, by things like um, the way the way our highest levels of administration look. If, if the highest levels of administration look like, you know, entirely white men, then that's not really giving, um, you know, young black women the opportunity to see someone like them in a position of leadership. So we see about 55% of undergraduate students are women, um, but only 17% of R1 presidents. Are women so that that representation isn't there and it's important from not just a gender perspective so I think using instructional design techniques um, using introductory seminars and just using our own expertise as faculty members we can foster that professionalism and um, encourage students to to treat women to treat people of color um, to treat all individuals in higher education equally and to provide a safer space
I've got a bunch of appendices, so I'll scroll through those in case anyone wants to read them, but that is my presentation. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, very informative and some really practical suggestions, I think, that that we can start to think about and have discussions around. Um, I do have two questions in the chat that I want to raise so that those don't get overlooked and then um, certainly open up the mics. So the first one is whether or not um, you feel that a student's gender bias might impact their ability to learn in the class. Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, this is my feeling, not my empirical evidence. Um, but I absolutely think that so I teach statistics face to face here in the political science department. And I think that students aren't expecting um, a woman to, to have the same expertise. So if they're assuming less qualifications, um, then they're going to start their, you know, so like we heard like Barbie, you know, Barbie said that math is really hard. Um, so it starts from the very youngest ages of assuming that women aren't as good as math, at math, that little girls are, are sort of told societally that they're not as good as math, at math. And it gets all the way to when I'm teaching in a college classroom, if students have this perception that I'm going to not be as good at math, um, then that's going to affect whether they can learn or not. So I definitely think that students are going to be taking their perceptions and they're not able to check them at the door, which is going to give them an idea of what they're going to experience in this classroom. Thank you. And do you have any data about the breakdown of the respondents over bias ratio? So it, was there a difference um, in the presence of bias in students differing between gender, age, culture, that sort of thing? So that was not within the scope of our IRB approval for this project. Um, student evaluations are anonymous here at Texas Tech, so we weren't able to get data about the students themselves. But Anne Boring's study from 2016, um, that is definitely where you should look if you're interested in student level characteristics and how that affects bias, because that is exactly what she looked at. Interesting. Very good. Um, so any other questions, feel free to type in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask um, Dr. Mitchell yourself. I know um, we would love for you to share your infographic on helping students understand evaluations um, when you're at that point and, and even your syllabus statement if you are willing to do that. That would be Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I can't see the chat, so if you, if somebody chats, please let me know. I will. Kind of a quiet group today. I guess I just told everything that you could possibly need to know. <laughs> Or you've left us with a whole lot to think about, right? <laughs> Hi, Christina. This is uh, Don Nowak from the University of Buffalo. Uh, I teach primarily online myself. Um, my question was, my, my question is, do you, um, when you and the other, the male graduate student were teaching uh, these online courses, did you make a concerted effort to, to try and, uh, give feedback, announcements, discussion boards, emails, and try to try to at least keep it some sort of continuity between the two of you there. So there there wasn't maybe one one of you weren't wasn't doing more for the students than than the other. Um, yeah, so we didn't um, I wouldn't say we intentionally planned that because this research was sort of done after we realized we were experiencing these differences. Um, but the way we interacted with students was very much the same. So the instructor, uh, so with these large classes, we have kind of a, we have a lot of graduate students that help us with the courses. So the graduate students would be the ones doing the grading and providing the feedback on assignments. Um, the only time that the instructor sort of interacted directly with a student during the semester would be when the student emailed to ask a question. So that would just be all sort of, you know, we do have an appendix with the emails that we sent, some samples of emails. Um, so you can kind of see if you think that he was nicer in emails. Maybe he was. I'm not very nice in emails. Um, but the instructor specific, in terms of posting announcements, um, we have course assistants that help us with that. Um, so I would say we interacted with the students about the same number of times, like in quantity. Um, but perhaps his quality was better, which is why we completely discounted questions that asked, you know, specifically about the instructor. Was this instructor effective? Maybe he was a more effective communicator, so we didn't even um, present a hypothesis on that. Oh, thank you. And I see um, that Tom has his hand raised. I don't know if you want to take the mic, Tom. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. 
Um, I, my background is in information design and communication. I work in assessment and I long felt that assessment is a key component of instructional design. You, you mentioned that a few times in your presentation. Um, and I also think that a key part of instructional design is continuous assessment. So I'm curious if you have thought about what vehicles could be used outside of uh, faculty evaluation or teaching evaluation to assess? Uh, yeah. So I don't have a lot of good evidence on whether there's something better, um, whether we can word things in different ways and get different information, or um, whether peer evaluations would be more or less, um, you know, biased. Uh, I don't have any data on that, but I think these are things worth exploring. Um, honestly, my personal preference would be self-evaluation, where I could generate a portfolio that tells you um, how I'm teaching in my discipline and how it's working and, um, you know, show some evidence of engagement. Uh, I'm skeptical about, you know, some other methods of, of assessment of learning um, because I don't know necessarily that they're measuring what we think they're measuring. Um, so I think sort of a self-evaluation is my preference, but I mean, I don't, again, I don't have a lot of evidence on what would work better. Um, we're still trying to get people to believe us that these don't work very well. Great, thank you. I have a couple comments and questions in the chat for you. Um, Rachel Ann has a, a comment and a question. So she teaches a lot of international students and many of her students' extra comments on evaluation lean toward her appearance, personality, and nurturing abilities. And she thinks a part of the nurturing tendency is that they are feeling more comfortable in the U.S. Uh, what do you recommend as far as explaining to students that comments about appearance are unacceptable, as this can be awkward to talk about? Oh man, I would just go for it. Um, so I, I think that, um, and I, I can share the infographic once it's completed. Um, we're still in the design stages of that project and you can imagine with four faculty members on a committee trying to pick what it looks like, it's been a pro quite a process. Um, but maybe in terms of um, providing this as a document, as a, a youthful infographic or a PDF, um, is a way to get around discomfort. If you feel discomfort, just like calling your students out and saying you can't talk about whether I'm hot or not. Um, and, uh, and so that's a way to get that same information across to tell them what an evaluation is for um, without having to have that discomfort of telling, you know, your international students, hey, please don't talk about my appearance. Please don't say whether I'm nice or rude. Like these aren't helpful comments. Um, but, but even framing it in the positive instead of saying, here's what you shouldn't do, um, giving some ideas about here's what you can do, here's what you should do, here's what this is for. Um, and giving students, I mean, students like to feel ownership in, you know, improving their educational experience. So telling students, I want your comments about the quality of the course itself, the assignments, um, you know, the homeworks. I want those comments so that I can improve the course next semester. Might help them frame their mind a little bit better in terms of, you know, what we want to do is hear about the course, not about the instructor. Um, the instructor level characteristics, there's not a lot you can change. Yeah, those are great suggestions. And I would say too, you know, um, maybe the infographic is one approach or something in your syllabus if you don't want to have the direct conversation, but also from an instructional design perspective, it could be something that, you know, your department or your institution or even you personally come up with something for the introductory model or module in your in your course, in your online course. So as part of developing class community, you know, where you talk about what's acceptable netiquette, what's acceptable email um, communication and how to contact you, you can talk about that there as well. Um, not that they always read those things, but um, it's a place to put it. <laughs> so that may also answer part of the next question, which was from a, another participant. How do you handle giving students constructive criticism? And I think what I hear you saying is also talking about what they can do and, and maybe empowering them as opposed to always focusing on what not to do. Absolutely. And I mean, I think this is something that that every faculty member struggles with is, you know, how do you how do you provide the feedback that students need to get, um, you know, without being too critical to where they shut you down um, and without being, you know, too lenient to where they don't get the information that they need. And I think, again, this is something that that sort of women are uniquely are in a unique challenge, a different challenge than men. Um, because going back to my anecdote about the online open house, um, you know, the student that was seeking, craving this approval from a male professor was a lot more willing to listen to his ideas and assume his expertise. 
Um, whereas I was trying to give constructive feedback to a student about how the Electoral College works and he was dismissing my expertise completely. Um, so I think women are definitely in more of a tricky position because we are expected to be nurturing. So you could either make your students happy and you know exhibit nurturing behavior as you provide feedback, um, but that's not always gonna help them. I mean, sometimes what they need to hear is, no, this was very bad and you didn't understand anything. Um, so learning how to, I mean, that's, it's a challenge I still struggle with. I don't know that I have really good advice on that, um, but I think framing it in terms of here's what you can do next time to improve, um, you know, that, that's about as useful as the suggestions I can give right now. Sure. And you did mention um, how you address uh, these issues of bias and sexism in course discussions a little bit. Um, and someone said that they remember you mentioning zero tolerance for bigoted comments, but how might you address those problems with the students? Do you do that through email, the discussion board when it happens? Do you address that publicly, privately? That sort of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I assign a zero in the gradebook, which is of course visible only to the student, and provide comments um, in the feedback um, that this was an inappropriate comment. Um, and it also, I mean, it depends on the severity of the comment. Um, you know, I've had I've had everything from just sort of mild, like women don't belong in stuff. Um, I hate to say that's mild because it's not, but um, compared to some of the things uh, I got once, a student wrote in a discussion board that uh, that. African Americans should be thankful for slavery because otherwise they'd be starving in Africa. And so that was one that warranted like a, you need to come to my office. We need to talk about this comment. Um, but of course I hide those, um, I hide those discussion posts from other students because I don't want other students to have to read something um, that's, you know, very offensive. Um, and then I address it either in a comment to the student in their feedback in an email, or I bring them into my office hours if it's something that I really feel needs to be addressed in person. Thank you. Definitely delicate sometimes. Um, there's a comment also from Purchase College that um, SETs are indirect measures and it would be good to focus more on direct measures of student learning. Just a comment in the chat. Yeah, I just don't know what those are. I mean, I don't know how we can directly measure student learning. That's where I struggle with that one. Um, I think learning outcomes assessment isn't the way to go. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how we measure student learning. We're, we're still working on that, I think, as a, as a, institution of higher education. Absolutely. Those are all the chat questions. Are there any others? Uh, or feel free again, take the mic if you'd like. Okay, well, not seeing or hearing any, I'll have you go to the next slide and we'll um, be sure that people have the resources that they need for wrapping up. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I just want to thank all of you for joining us today for our featured fellow chat. This webinar was recorded and there's a link right there, a bit.ly link. Um, that The recording will be posted to the same site where you registered. And it will also be uploaded to our Open SUNY YouTube channel. We would like to thank Dr. Mitchell for sharing her expertise with our community and also to the Newton Network for their continued partnership and to Texas Tech University for supporting today's webinar as well. We hope that you have found this informative. You can go to the bit.ly at the bottom there to read more about the research study itself. And we look forward to seeing you all at another virtual event soon. Thank you so much uh, again, Christina, and to everyone who attended and asked questions. Thank you very much.